Good morning, my name is Ellen. Uh, today's reading comes from Psalm 77, verses one to 20. Please follow along in your own Bibles or simply listen as the scriptures are read. Again, that's Psalm 77, starting with verse one. Following the reading, I invite you to respond in worship with the singing of the doxology. Parents and guardians of children in nursery, preschool, and kindergarten through second grade, you're invited to escort your children to the front of the room to join Kids Commons outside. As you are able, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. <clears throat> Hear the word of the Lord. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I am troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You with an arm redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O oh God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water, the skies gave forth thunder, your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind, your lightnings lighted up the world, the earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Good morning. My name is Gary. Most of you know me. I've been a part of Haverhill Commons for the past six years at least. I'm uh, feeling a bit anxious this morning, as in Inside Out 2 for all you Disney Pixar fans, to be speaking on a topic of anxiety. So, some of you might be feeling a little anxious this morning for other reasons. And I think, as is our practice, we'll take a minute to quiet our hearts and minds and receive his peace, the peace that passes all understanding. Lord, we do thank you for the chance to come together and to accept the peace that you provide in our most anxious moments. Be with us now as we hear your words. In Christ's name, amen. In May, uh, Matt indicated a sure system of personality typing that describes patterns in how people interpret the world and manage their emotions. Sevens are about as carefree as they come. But nonetheless, all of us experience this emotion of anxiety and it's felt in some degree or another, at some time or another, being part of the human experience. 
So I want to begin by telling you of a significant anxiety-provoking event in my life, not to mention my wife Ellen's, who did give me permission to share this. No HIPAA violations here. Um, in the summer of 2015, Ellen's mother, Florence, was diagnosed with stage four cancer. We traveled to North Carolina to be with her in her last days at a hospice house. Our son, Ethan, and daughter-in-law, Callie, arrived as well. When we had to return home, Ellen's sisters came and took up the vigil. Ellen said her bedside goodbyes to her mom, who was no longer consciously aware. Not surprisingly, this was a very emotional time. Tears and grief and heartfelt words and prayer. Then we left. In the Uber to the airport, Ellen said she wasn't feeling well, that her chest and jaw hurt. Being a seasoned physician, I reassured her this was likely just the stress and emotion of her final departure. Here's an early lesson. Don't trust a family member of health professional when your own health is at stake. On our connecting flight to Charlotte during the descent, Ethan, sitting with his mom, came up to me and said, you need to get back here. Mom is not doing well. I anxiously went back and was stunned to see her in such distress. She was weak, pale, cold, clammy, the flight attendant said we would be landing in 10 minutes and called ahead for EMTs to meet us at the gate. Stretcher, to an elevator down to the tarmac, to a waiting ambulance, to the hospital emergency room. In the ER, I watched helplessly as all the parameters looked ominous. Very low blood pressure, positive cardiac enzymes, markedly dysfunctional heart muscle on echo. The look of anxiety on Ellen's face mirrored mine. I knew the definition of what high anxiety was at that point. Although she was the one in grave danger, and you can ask her about her own experience sometime, I myself was physically distressed, sick to my stomach, racing heart, mentally disoriented. I prayed or I should say, I threatened God. I will not forgive you if you let her die. No immediate response. Then I negotiated. Are you crazy, God? You do not want to take her. She loves Jesus. She's compassionate, caregiving, not to mention organized. I was willing to concede that as a positive personality trait, but no answer. Then I selfishly despaired. God, I cannot live without her. Nothing. The staff cardiologist came in and said Ellen needed an emergency heart catheterization for a diagnosis and treatment. Ethan, Callie, and I went to a small consultation room and waited till midnight. I expect many of you have had intensely anxious moments in your lives, maybe not life or death, maybe, but major times of uncertainty and distress. The writer of today's psalm certainly did. Let's take a look at Psalm 77 together. The identity of the author is a little unclear. The heading states, to the choir master, according to Jeduthun, who many scholars equate with the musician Ethan, the name we had chosen from the psalms for our son. Or possibly Asaph was the writer, to whom many psalms are credited. Regardless, I love the author's willingness to lay bare his emotions, to not hold back, to be brutally honest. No sugarcoating here. At Havel Commons, it has been a great relief to find a space where doing that is not just allowed, but actually encouraged. Hiding behind showered bodies, shaved faces, spiritual facades, can be a barrier for God to enter and act, and closes the door to meaningful relationships among each other, nor can it allow for transformative change. The writer here doesn't tell us the nature of his distress. Perhaps his own life is threatened, or his family is at risk, or the nation of Israel itself is in danger. He only says in verse 2, in the day of my trouble, 
we can assume it was significant by his response. He cries out to God aloud. He says it twice for emphasis, aloud to God. In Hebrew, repetition is like double exclamation points in text messages. God can endure our penetrating cries and even our angry ones. The psalmist reaches out his hands, whether with open palms in desperate prayer or clenched in white knuckles, fear and anger. And especially, he says, in the night. Why is it that nighttime magnifies our emotions? Pain is often worse at night when our stress-fighting cortisol levels drop. Intrusive thoughts come in as daytime distractions disappear. Sleeplessness besets us as our minds race. And even dreams after falling asleep can be disturbing. And aside, last night I awoke at 1.30 in a cold sweat, having dreamt that at the very last moment I lost all my sermon notes when I was about to talk. In verse 4, he attributes his insomnia to God himself. You hold my eyelids open, whether wakeful to pray through the night or sleepless as a result of his distress. His very soul, the essence of our being, our mind, our will, and our emotions, cannot be comforted. What starts as cries transitions to moanings. Often our intelligible words degenerate into mere groans. Our hearts troubled to the point of pre preventing coherent thoughts or sentences. He says, I am so troubled that I cannot speak. We can almost hear Paul in the book of Romans say, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Meditating even on God's word only leads to fainting of his spirit. He's at his wit's end, crying aloud, reaching out, comfortless, moaning, fainting in spirit, sleepless, speechless. These are all elements of physical, emotional, psychological distress that are hallmarks of anxiety. Anxiety has been defined in the medical world, and I'll quote one definition, a complex response to real or perceived threats. It can involve cognitive, physical, and behavioral changes. Real or perceived danger causes a rush of adrenaline, which in turn triggers these anxiety reactions in a process called fight or flight. Some people may experience this response in difficult social situations or around important events or decisions. I do want to make a distinction here between intermittent anxiety and generalized anxiety disorder, a medical condition, the difference being in the degree, extent, and real versus absent danger. Generalized anxiety disorder may require the help of a mental health professional. But here we're talking about those situations that confront us episodically in the face of real and present danger. And how do we define danger? Well, our good friends Miriam and Webster describe danger as an exposure or limit liability to injury, pain, harm, or loss. Danger is something that threatens a person's integrity, their oneness or wholeness, either socially as fear of others' opinions about us, or of inadequacy that we cannot do what we need or should, or physically, that an injury or pain is significant enough that even life itself feels threatened. We have all encountered such times, and many may be experiencing such right now. Impending job loss, marital discord, a serious illness, a bullied child. The list of life's difficulties can be a long one. But as followers of Christ, a distressing element of anxiety is our belief that there is a God, a loving Father, and yet not seeing him lessen or remove the danger that threatens us. This is our writer's dilemma. Where are you, God? If you are the great I am, why aren't you now? Do you know what that feeling is like? Are there questions that your heart is crying out to God this morning? 
To address this, the psalmist elects what we would call today, perhaps, self-talk. He says, I will consider the days of old, remember my song in the night, meditate in my heart, make a diligent search. He asks himself, will God always spurn, never again be favorable, cease to show his steadfast love, break his promises, forget his grace, shut out his compassion? These are about as desperate as questions can get. Some have taken these inquiries to be rhetorical. Come on, self, seriously, of course not. God wouldn't do that. But the fact that he asks the questions, to me, implies he is at least considering the possibility that the answer might be yes. And I think in our most anxious moments, if we are honest with ourselves, we ask these same questions with a similar fear. Our extended family loves games, board games, and especially card games. Growing up, we played a card game called I Doubt It. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with it. It's a game of truth and lies, and your task is to determine if your opponents are describing accurately and truthfully their cards or are faking it, in which case you emphatically state, I doubt it. The root of anxiety, it seems to me, at times can be doubt. Not the kind in that card game, but a much more unsettling doubt. Doubt with a capital D. There is some debate in the scholarly world whether doubt is an emotion or a mental state. But Wikipedia defines it in both ways. Quote, a mental state in which the mind remains suspended between two or more contradictory propositions. Doubt on an emotional level is indecision between belief and disbelief. A place we probably have all been. Indecision between belief and disbelief. As Christians, we've been told at times that doubt should have no role to play in our lives. We are quoted verses like James 1, 6. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea tossed in driven by the wind, or Matthew 21, quoting Jesus. Truly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And again, in Luke 24, Jesus said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your heart? And of course, we're all familiar with poor doubting Thomas, who had to touch the wounds of the risen Christ to believe. But like anxiety, doubt is part of the human condition. Few, if any of us, haven't experienced it. Doubt is like the flip side of faith. If we could have 100% certainty, which is an impossibility, there would be no need for faith. If we were 100% certain, we would not need God, we would be like God, we would be God. It doesn't help that the one thing we claim to be the greatest truth, God himself, is the one thing for which we have the least sensory evidence, and oh how we do trust our five senses. When Ellen was on the brink in the emergency room, I feared for her life. I couldn't believe God would let her die. But what if he did? What if he had a bigger purpose than her life alone? Or my selfishly wanting her to be with me? What if a sinful, broken, rebellious world produces tragedy and his plan to redeem is far grander than I could ever know? What if, as Isaiah says in chapter 55, his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts? Or again, the writer in Deuteronomy 29 states, the secret things belong to God, but what he chooses to reveal belongs to us. Could I live with that? Would I have to live with that? Or what if something even scarier were true? The biblical writers are not afraid to question God's motives and actions, openly, even angrily at times. 
but they rarely question his existence. And I remember while pacing the hospital halls, that thought arose. It is one thing to question, what if God isn't faithful? What if he isn't compassionate, isn't full of steadfast love? But it is a very different thing to question, what if God isn't? Many of you may have seen the movie Gravity. There is a scene in the film, an explosion, and Sandra Bullock's character is whirling in space, attached to the arm of the spacecraft. Then, at the command of her superior, played by George Clooney, she detaches from the anchoring mechanical arm to avoid being destroyed by the flying debris and is suddenly completely adrift, with no up or down, no right or left, no reference point, whirling in an empty space. Watching the film, I physically felt unmoored. I think I actually grabbed the armrests of the chair to stabilize myself. That was the emotion I experienced in Ellen's crisis when I questioned, what if God isn't? What if there is no God at all? And all of this is just random chaos. Then, of course, there is no God to appeal to, to go negotiate with, to shake my fist at, no protection for Ellen or me, no meaning at all. An existential moment, to be sure. The writer of our psalm perhaps is feeling this. Verse 10 is a little bit difficult to translate. The ESV and some other translations have it as, Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. But the New American Standard says, this is my grief that the right hand of the Most High has changed. The prophet Malachi recorded this divine proclamation, I am the Lord and I change not. If the Most High God is changed, then he is not God. Ultimately, we cannot prove with 100% certainty the answer to this most foundational question. What if he isn't? But I believe that is intrinsic to God's design. He is the God of relationship. First, in his triune nature, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then with us, his creation. Relationship inherently implies trust and giving of oneself to the other. Even in our most intimate human relationships, we can never know for certain the heart and mind of the one we love, but we abandon ourselves to the other to trust they will be there. It is no different with God. We determine to let go of the cliff's edge of certainty on which we hang, not into a black abyss of nothingness, but into the unseen arms of one who says, I am here to catch you, and carry you home. I have done it before, and I will again. Faith is required and given to us as a gift to know with as much certainty as we can that he is, that he is there, and that he is not silent. For me in that day in the hospital in the ensuing days, I chose to believe that, and I continue to do so. As Ellen's results returned, we learned she had suffered a condition called Takasubu's cardiomyopathy, a medical mouthful. For the layperson known as broken heart syndrome, her heart was damaged by an assault of adrenaline from the stress, anxiety, and emotion of releasing her mother. In the days and weeks to follow, she would gradually recover, and thankfully, God in fact chose to return her to us healthy and whole. The psalmist is also reassured of this in verses 11 to 15. He changes his course and declares, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. With your arm redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. Chrissy, in our first psalm study, so eloquently referenced the key role of remembrance. 
the writer here reiterates, saying, I will remember and meditate on his deeds done, his wonders witnessed. He takes these steps to climb out of the pit of anxious doubt. He acknowledges God's immutable character, saying, O oh God, you are holy. Morally holy, yes, but holy as in he is other, like no other, set apart from us. He is the first principle. Great, greater than all, omnipotent. He holds all things together by the word of his power. We live and breathe and have our being because of him. He is wonder working from the creation of the universe to the conception of a new human life and everything in between. He is the revealer, making known his might among the people, both in his actions and in his word. And he is redeemer. For us in the person of Jesus, he has saved us from ourselves, from our sin, from the forces that would destroy us. Not just me, but his people in all generations. From Jacob, the deceiver, to Joseph, the deliverer, and all before and since who trust in him. The psalmist recalls a most specific event where God saved his people, the exodus from Egypt, declaring, The sea feared him, the waters parted, the skies were lit, thunder rolled, the earth trembled in delivering Israel from Pharaoh. I was struck by verse 19. Your way was through the sea and through the great waters. God could have delivered his people in some other way. He could have convinced Pharaoh to let the people go. He could have wiped out the Egyptians before the people even reached the sea. He could have taken Israel around the water. But he didn't do any of that. His way was through the sea. While we don't often seek out or cherish the anxiety-producing moments of life, they are not outside of God's control. And when we learn to walk with God in those moments, we can see even more how great a deliverer he is. A few of you may know a second most anxious moment for me was a near drowning experience as a six-year-old that affects me even today. I can identify literatively and figuratively with the writer of Psalm 69 who says, Save me, O God, for the waters are coming unto my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. But even there we can say with David in the shepherd's psalm, Yea, though I walk through the valley of death, I fear no evil. Why? Because I, my family, us, the church, will surely escape all pain, all suffering, or even death. No, of course not, but rather because thou art with me. While sometimes God does heal and rescue in these anxious, threatening moments, sometimes God does not. Sometimes our stories actually end with the loss of a loved one or with God redeeming in a different way than the physical restora restoration. Yet we can still trust the promises of Scripture that God is with us. I love this line in verse 19, yet your footprints were unseen. The meaning here is also somewhat enigmatic, but I choose to take this as there were no footprints for the people to follow through the seabed because he was not so much ahead of them as present with them. We should also be reminded that his presence with us is often in the person of others. For that trying week in Charlotte, North Carolina, it was our son and daughter-in-law coming alongside it was a local friend of theirs who took us into her home at 1 a.m. Later, our daughter Lauren and her husband Chris on furlough from missionary work in Indonesia arriving. And the hospital hostel where I was able to stay for out-of-state family members. Even the comfort and routine of the Starbucks barista providing a daily cup of coffee. Brothers and sisters, do not underestimate the significance of you, your being a steady source of stability for someone suffering in anxious times. And let us not avoid reaching out to and accepting help from someone like that when we're the ones in trouble. But ultimately, it is the person of Jesus 
who went through the waters, who walked in the valley of death, who accompanies us at every step of our journey, who sees us through to the end, no matter how anxiety provoking the circumstance, no matter how dreadful the situation, no matter the outcome in this life. In the midst of sinking in the quagmire of anxiety and doubt, Christ can be our solid rock. To pluralize the words of the hymn we are about to sing, when darkness veils his lovely face, we rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, our anchor holds within the veil. On Christ, the solid rock, we stand. All other ground is sinking sand.